Hello, my name is Ray Bagnuolo, and I am a minister of the Word and Sacrament in the Presbyterian Church, USA, and I am gay. I'm talking this afternoon about the violence that has infiltrated our society, most notably in the last few weeks, or publicly, I should say, based on the bullying incidents that led to the death of Tyler Clementi here in New York and in New Jersey, the several other deaths that have been spoken of that we're learning about as a result of bullying and homophobia and discrimination and bias. And of course, going back to a time only a short 10 years ago or so when Matthew Shepard, the Matthew Shepard incident that I thought would be the last one of its kind, because once that happened, how could anybody ever want to see that happen again? And perhaps as tragic as his death was, that out of that incident would come a whole change in the way that we worked with one another and cared for one another and welcomed one another. And unfortunately, not much has changed, except the numbers continue to increase of people, young people in particular, but many people of all different ages, who continue to be marginalized and oppressed and pushed into situations where because they are gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, or even questioning their sexual identity, that they find themselves in situations that none of us who are Christian, none of us who are faithful people of just about any religion or tradition that I can think of, would ever want to see happen to anybody else. And that's my point today. We've heard a lot in the last weeks about government agencies, about schools, about bullying programs, about gay-straight alliances in schools and different programs to help kids, and they're wonderful. And we've heard about the church being, well, not too much about the church. And I wonder if that's because the truth is that these incidents that are taking place, these horrible human tragedies that are affecting family, friends, loved ones, the broader society, are in fact being caused by some of the practices and the teachings of the church. A few weeks ago I attended the vigil for Tyler Clementi, the young Rutgers student who, because of incidents with the internet and what some of his friends, friends had done, felt that the only solution to the way he felt about being outed as a gay person was to take his own life. So I attended a vigil with many others in Washington Square Park here in New York City. And I walked in wearing this collar. And I felt that the collar that night, I thought of it, was not only a symbol of compassion and hope and promise, but in many ways it was a symbol of the complicity of the churches in the way that they have set up their denominations or continued to exclude people from their churches in the full partnership and membership and leadership of those churches, that the collar is a symbol of complicity that says to others, well, we can't quite welcome you yet. You're really not right yet for us. And if only you could change, if only you could be different, and we love you, but but, and that message, that message of wavering, of what is it? A message of dismissal by the churches is translated into the broader population, especially those who are on the edges, that says to them, see, even your church says that you're not whole. Even your church says you're a second-class citizen. Even your church, even your church. And from the words and the name-calling and the epithets comes the violence that instead of speaking out against and welcoming people and being a symbol to others of what it means to be fully welcoming and inclusive and loving, we become part of the violence. I believe that deep in everybody's heart, if we could sit long enough to really talk about the violence that is happening, the terrible hurt that is happening across so many levels to people as a result of the way we're treating this marginalized community, of which I am a part, perhaps you are, but I promise you, of which somebody you know and love most likely is, if we could only find a way to figure out how to send out a message of love and compassion and welcoming rather than looking the other way and allowing people to interpret our actions as reasons for their terrible actions, 
If we could do that, what a difference we could make. And in fact, I think that in just about every denomination and tradition that I know of, religious tradition that I know of, that is exactly what we're called to do. We are called to bring people together. We are called to honor their sacred divinity in the form of the humanity being created by those gods that people in different traditions worship, by the God that we worship in ours, by whatever name we may know those gods in each of our traditions that we are called to something much better than this. And that when our actions produce these kinds of results, no matter how unintentional it may be, we have to take responsibility for this. And we have to stand up and acknowledge that we are wrong. In our denomination, we are going through a process, as are many others, in trying to change the polity and legislation within our denominations to open the doors. How I wish we would do that just as a matter of how we loved one another and of the hearts that we have. But if we can't do it from that place, then let the legislation pass. Let us get to the point where our door is open, where people are welcome, where we err if we err on the side of love. And try to get beyond this so that we can get on with healing and working together and embracing one another with our differences. Because there are two fundamental reasons that I think make this a primary thing we must do. One is that the God of our understanding in this denomination, the God that we know and perhaps the one you do too that you follow, could never ask us to do anything that would produce such violence as leading a young person to jump off a bridge. And that the God that we know, however you know God, could never possibly want you to exclude or marginalize others and to feed that discrimination, that hate, that deep dislike and aversion, that hate, that translates into such terrible acts and fills us with such awful spiritual vacancies in our lives that we can't even see the wrong we're doing. So this is a call. It's a call to religious leaders. It's a call to, to all of us to reach out to one another. It's a call to stop this violence, to step up, to accept our own complicity in this, and to change it, and to get together, and to put aside these differences, and to stop things from happening like they are happening now, and to be a part of the solution that carries the message of a loving God and a place of worship and a home for all those who seek such things, and for those that don't that they know that we love them and care for them just as they are. And they needn't change one thing in terms of the way they were created to be recipients of that love or welcoming in our churches, our denominations, our homes, our neighborhoods. If we as religious leaders can't carry that message, then perhaps this collar really needs to come off.